So, we have a very special guest, a recent Riot uh, acquisition, I would say. Yes. Right? So right. this is uh, Ken Basin, and you have a really fascinating job, and I think especially with the success of Arcane, a lot of people are going to want to hear from you. So why don't you explain what you do? Yeah, so, um, hi, I'm Ken. Uh, I'm the global head of business operations. Hi! <laughs> uh, for, I'm the global head of business operations for film and television at Riot, so I'm helping to build a studio that's going to make movies and TV shows for everybody here. Great. So, Obviously, I would love for you to leak things. Uh, yes, uh, they would love for me not to leak things. <laughs> okay, it will be a battle then. <laughs> so, Contest of wills. So what, when, they, when they brought you in, what was your expertise and, and what, what, what did they say they wanted from you right out of the gate? Sure, so uh, my background, I'm a lawyer and I, I worked at a bunch of kind of traditional content places uh, and non-traditional. I worked at Amazon Studios in the early days. I was at Sony and Paramount. And most recently, I was the guy in charge of all the deals at Paramount Television, the studio that makes like Jack Ryan and 13 Reasons Why. And uh, they brought me in because part of what is so important to Riot and what Riot wants to do differently from other video game companies that have tried to get into the space is, you know, the excellence bar is so high and the need for creative control to make sure that we're doing sort of right by the characters and right by the fans is so high that we want to produce all this stuff ourselves and not, you know, hand the rights over to a Disney or a Universal or a Sony or whatever to produce things for us. So my job is to basically make us as a company ready to produce big budget, like, you know, $100 million plus movies, animated features, animated series, live action features, live action series, and to do it in-house at Riot so we can deliver stories that are authentic to our, our world. Were you, were you the person who kind of took over Fortiche? So Fortiche was the animation studio that, that created Arcane. Were you in charge of that process, or did that happen before you got there? So um, the relation with Fortiche happened before I got there, but I work really closely with the Fortiche guys. I'm actually on the board of Fortiche as well. And so, you know, they are amazing. They are yeah. true artists. Arcane's success... And everything that makes it great creatively is really like a marriage of that input from Christian and Alex as the creators and the writers, uh, and Pascal and Arnaud and Jerome, the directors at uh, at Fortiche. Like, just it's one of the reasons why I came to the company. I joined the company after Arcane came out, and I looked at that and I said, "This is the first thing they ever made. That's incredible. A company yeah. that can do this first out the gate is is a thing I want to be a part of." Yeah, actually, my college roommate was one of the writers on Arcane. That's so. awesome. <laughs> I know a lot about the, you know, the production cycle of it. And it was, Has he recovered yet? Uh, <laughs> I mean, look, it took a long time. Yeah, okay. I, I, I think you know, Arcane has just been in development for such a long time. So what do, you, what do you bring so that you can kind of streamline these processes and make sure that these, you know, Arcane was great, but it went through like a lot of different iterations and, and it took quite, quite a lot of resources. And especially for a company like Riot where they don't necessarily have an expertise in making this kind of content. Yes. Yeah, right. Well, so um, a big part of it is, you know, in working with Fortiche, uh, it was a great advantage because making an animated series, we were able to tap into this existing company that really understood Riot. They had done the Get Jinxed video a while back. Right. They had done the Echo Seconds video. So they really knew our characters. They knew the company, and they were a really natural kind of fit. But... Um, you know, what we want to do goes beyond just animation to the live action world as well. And that's the world that I really come from. So I help, you know, kind of, I, I'm working on Arcane Season 2, but I would say my biggest kind of contribution is to make the deals with the writers and directors who are going to come in and be our like, filmmaking partners on this stuff to sort of just you know, figure out what the business plan for all of this. And it's really cool. It's very different from any other job I've ever had because the definition of success is different at Riot than the definition of success anywhere else. You know, anywhere else I've worked, it's really just sort of a basic matter problem how many dollars did you spend and how many dollars did you make and that's it but for us uh it's so much more about kind of like serving the player base impacting the culture really like taking league of legends and the characters to an audience that doesn't know them yet but even more important than that like really deepening fandom for people well i mean in a way too if you guys make a movie obviously like the money that comes in is important but it's also you have a secondary objective of getting more people into your games at the same time so you actually have multiple ways to to make money off of your audience in a way that other properties may not yeah i mean actually like you could make a little bit of an analogy to Amazon, where Amazon is fundamentally like not in the business of selling movies and TV shows. Amazon is in the business of selling everything, mostly through Prime subscriptions and everything else follows that. And so the movies and TV shows are a way of building a relationship with the customer, of making them sort of like ecosystem players. And, you know, in all sort of content, in all entertainment, there's a huge difference between like and love. 
And so, yeah, that aspect of it that's about bringing in new you know, fans and new players is important, but a huge part of our focus really is on the existing fan base and helping to take people from like to love and also giving them an opportunity to express their fandom to their friends and family members who may not fully understand League or be fully invested in that kind of video game space, but you bring them a movie or a TV show and all of a sudden they can get it. Well, that, that was my next question. What is the platforms or the future platforms that I think can be looked at. Is it as we go to on demand, as we go to linear TV, obviously movies, on demand movies? Like, it, it, can we expect all of it in the future? That is what you're trying to, I guess, prepare Riot to be able to provide? So, those are the kinds of questions that we're working on answering right now. I mean, for Arcane, obviously, it's on Netflix. They've been amazing partners. And one of the great things about being with Netflix is they have such amazing global reach, so, such a massive subscriber base. And that was a big factor for us in deciding to go with them is it gave us the opportunity to sort of reach the most people. Right now, we're sort of like in that planning phase where we think of a major media company and we're thinking about how we might work with that company. Combination of streamers and theatrical distributors, you know, Accessibility is so important, making sure that we are creating the opportunity for anybody who wants to watch this content to find it in a reasonable way. Um, and, and again, like social impact is important. We look at something like The Gray Man that was on Netflix a little while ago. They spent $200 million on this giant movie with the Russo brothers and Ryan Gosling. And it was like eight days of conversation in the culture before it was you know, overtaken by like a rom-com that was made for like $4 million or something, right? So we want to find a way to make sure that our stuff is, is noisier. And I, that's like a really cliched phrase, but you know, has the ability to sort of like stay in the cultural conversation. And again, having, like, having our content be a bridge for the league players and the league fans to their like non-league friends and family is a really important function and role of the content. So we have to find ways to get it out there that kind of like accomplishes that goal. So my question is, you mentioned not really wanting to go out of house and actually kind of taking this in-house so you don't end up with uh, Chris Pratt as Ezreal or something like that. Uh, <laughs> or, or, <laughs> or Jake Gyllenhaal as the Prince of Persia. There you or go. or the, the, the Warcraft movie. So how, how, what kind of process is it for you guys to decide like what that in-house quality means and how you take your characters from the game uh, in games now and put them into a TV show following those storylines? Which storylines do you choose? Like... What's the, what's the creative process like for that? So, um, first, it's really character first and character driven. And it, this is one way where League is like an amazing property to get to like play with in a film and TV space because the game is essentially non narrative, right? Like that MOBA format, there's no. There's a lot of lore and there's a lot of background, but there isn't story embedded in the game that we either have to sort of duplicate or find an excuse for why we're not doing. And it really starts with champions, you know, and, and picking combinations of champions who have an interesting relationship, who have conflict between them, and starting from that and building the world around it rather than building the world and trying to shoehorn the champions within it. And I think you really see that with Arcane, where like Arcane, you get this great window into Piltover and Zaun, but fundamentally it's, it's a show about sisters. It's a show yep. about surrogate fathers and the families that we make for ourselves. It has a certain Shakespearean quality. And to me, that's why it works fundamentally. And then all of this like grandeur and, 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 and you know, the production design, like the uniqueness of that world sort of keeps you hooked and makes you want more, but you get in because of that emotional investment with the characters. So that's where we start and we, we do that knowing a lot and asking a lot of questions about our players. We know, you know, how many people play as each of the champions, but outside of like play patterns we do a lot of sort of research to understand like the, the champions that people feel emotionally connected to and we try to use that to inform which stories we tell and we also really want to sort of take advantage of like the natural diversity and inclusivity of the Runeterra universe because much more than like a traditional fantasy you know we, we sometimes joke about like we're not just like beautiful white people riding horses right it's like every part of Runeterra isn't like a different part of western Europe and so we really want to make sure that we're choosing stories and champions that represent that full breadth of the Runeterran continent so that everybody has an opportunity to see a story that sort of speaks to them in that way. 
So what, what are your, your first projects? Because you talked about doing some TV, some film stuff. Like, what are your, your primary goals as you, as you start taking on this position and building out this massive new infrastructure for Riot? Yeah, so, I mean, one thing that they would absolutely kill me is if I described what any of the projects were substantively. Of course. No, 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 no. Um, there, There's a sniper, like, on the roof of the Chase Center. <laughs> like, uh, this is the, not the place to announce The best that. part <laughs> of that, by the way, is that so many people actually, like, looked up to check to see if there was really a sniper there. I found that really satisfying. Thank you for like your belief in me in that, that was way. The, that's the power of Riot right there. Yeah. <laughs> we're all scared. <laughs> yeah. Besides, if, if, there were, if there were Riot snipers, I would already be dead. Honestly, so. do, uh, obviously, also don't be absurd. If they're Riot snipers, they're too good. You can't see them. Like they're out of your sight. Please. So, um, so I can't get into like what the specific champions that we're working with or with the stories that we're doing, but I can say that we are developing across, you know, I sometimes like, use the kind of dorky science analogy. Do you remember Punnett squares from biology of like genomes, right? So like in the Punnett square of like animated and live action and features and series, it's like yes, 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 and yes. We have ambitions in all four of those. We have projects in right. all four of those. And we really, you know, do have a slate right now, like I said, that sort of like kind of takes you across the Runeterran continent. And one thing that's really cool, I think, about what we're doing and different from what other companies have done in the past is, you know, our stories are all going to exist in a shared universe. There is one Runeterra, but it's not as like aggressively linear, at least out the gate. So we have an opportunity to kind of like develop a lot of stories and whatever's really truly working and, and is coming out the best and as far as along can kind of get moved to the front of the line because we don't have this like linear dependence of, oh man, the script is so good, we can't wait to make this movie, but it's not going to make sense until we release two other movies first. So we've tried to design for like modularity uh, and ultimately, it does all tie together. There's a bigger story being told that weaves these things through, but we have flexibility, which allows us to sort of like get the best stuff out to the players faster. I love that. That you know, for for the weebs out there like me, that's like Gundam. The Gundam universe is not linear, right. and it was all released. But if you now take a step back, like 30, 40 years later you could just see the whole timeline and how it all fits in together, and you're like, oh, I can watch it in order, which doesn't make sense, or yeah. I can watch it the order that it was released, and that kind of makes sense. Well, and like awesome. A huge part of what we do is, you know, we're trying to do something different than anyone has done, but there are a lot of companies that in various ways have done things that are similar to what we've done, and we try to learn a lot of lessons from everybody, from the big video game companies, from the big comic book companies. And so, for example, um, you know, if you look at like the original Marvel program on Netflix that was like building up to Defenders across Daredevil and Jessica Jones and Luke Cage and Iron Fist, it's like by the time you got to Defenders, which wasn't a very good show in the first place, you I had like 40 to 80 hours of homework that you had to have I done in the meantime, right? And it's so, you know, it, it, like it sort, just sort of like creates an inaccessibility to people. Um, and also in the case of those shows, which like I watched and liked a lot of them, but like they kind of made a promise they didn't deliver on, right? And, you know, ultimately the thing that's sort of so amazing and really different for me working in a place like Riot compared to like a normal film or TV studio is, you know, they're really not lying when they say that like excellence is the most important thing. And we would rather, you know, at great cost kill a project deep into its process because it's just not good enough than put out something that we're not proud of and make a little profit on it. Like, because at the end of the day, it's not about like standing up a studio that is just gonna like economically compete with Warner Brothers or Universal. It's about standing up a studio that serves the Riot community and like is part of Riot's broader goals. And that's such a more interesting problem for me, just like as a professional, than you know, doing you know, co you know, revenue minus cost equals profit. So we'll we'll play a little game as we as we conclude <laughs> talking to you, which is that. If you had, in your perfect universe, if you could create, like, the perfect League of Legends movie, let's say, who would direct it, and who would you cast as some of the characters if you had total control? Oh, man. Um... Dropping the bomb question here. <laughs> yeah, a that's... little game, Monty calls it. <laughs> I, I, by, by the way, I, I, I was thoroughly not prepared for this question, so now I'm really going to have to think about it in real time. I mean, okay, I'll say this. The kind of filmmaker that we want to work with, it's like a really specific kind of person because you want somebody who can really deliver a fully realized world, but you want somebody who's going to like really be willing to like work with Riot and Runeterra as it is and not sort of demand that they turn it into something else because they need to assert their authorship over it and their ownership of it. And so we're really looking for like a specific 
kind of mentality of creative partner, somebody who brings that like desire to collaborate, that recognition that, you know, we're trying to find ways to give people a lot of space creatively. You know, we, instead of having like, you know, we, bring, we don't bring in a writer and say, okay, here's the story we need you to write and these 15 things need to happen in it, right? It's much more like, here's the story we want to tell, here are the characters who are involved, here's kind of where we want to start, here's where we want to end and help us get to that place in the way that feels right to you. But at the end of the day, you do need somebody who's like really willing to sort of participate in the bigger picture. And so we, you know, the ideal collaborators for us are people who play league, right? That's a great sure. place to start. Yeah, yeah, we yeah, are yeah. finding writers and directors who play league. And then, you know, even beyond writers and directors who play league, we're finding other ones that are gamers because, you know, until very recently, if you came to the Riot campus in LA and you went on the guest Wi-Fi, the guest Wi-Fi password was player experience first exclamation mark. Like that's like how built into the mentality of it. And so we feel like by working with writers and directors who you know, have that same affinity to video games as a medium and to a video game audience, like they're gonna know what's gonna deliver the experience that our players want. You he that, he, he, dodged, the he dodged the question. So I'll ask a different question, and, uh, and, we'll, and we'll wrap it up after that, Ken. So, I totally dodged the question, but I gave like a somewhat <laughs> interesting <laughs> answer that was a dodge to the question. All right, you are a lawyer. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, so based, based on this, what, because a lot, I think a lot of gamers would say that many of the adaptations that have been made in gaming are shit. Yes. And so would we. I yes. Mean, that's not official. Uh, edit that out. Sorry. <laughs> um, what, do you, what do you think that Riot's doing differently to make adaptations not shit? So, I mean, like, this is a question that we are constantly asking ourselves to make sure we're staying accountable to. And, and to answer it, we try to, like, look at what caused the, that failure in all of those other examples and not make that same mistake. So, for example, start with, like, Ubisoft, right? You look at Prince of Persia. They handed the keys over to Disney. They let them do whatever they wanted. There was no, like, sense of fidelity in protecting the underlying fan. Have you noticed that there hasn't been a Prince of Persia game that came out in the last 15 years? I've like noticed. Tragic, really. Yeah. It's a great so, game. So, like, that, so, lesson one is, you know, we really we have trust issues, and we don't trust anybody to get the characters and get the world as, as much as we do. So we're really investing a lot in making sure we have the ability to do it ourselves. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, let's say on Ubisoft, and, like, their next time out, Assassin's Creed. So when... Ubisoft hired writers to work on Assassin's Creed. They were so burned by the experience of Prince of Persia that, like, when they hired the writers, they gave them, like, a style guide uh, uh, that they had to follow. Of, you know, These are the rules of the universe. It was 200 pages long, right? Wow. So it became so prescriptive and so, like, you just got to basically find a way to, like, redo the video game in movie and TV format. And that doesn't work either because movies and TV are a different creative format with different rules and it works in different ways. So you can't like overcorrect from the Prince of Persia example and become so exacting on it. You do need to give those filmmakers freedom and space to do what they do. Another um, thing is looking at like Blizzard and Warcraft. And Blizzard and Warcraft, Warcraft to me is the opposite of what I was saying where that movie was all about world building. They wanted to you know, show you the vistas, they wanted to give you a sense of the magic and the world, but you did not care about anybody who was there. And it, True. Like, there was no emotional investment whatsoever. And so, you know, again, we're trying to do this character first and the world flows from the character rather than world, flows, uh, world first and characters flow from that. And then, you know, the, the last aspect of it, and maybe the most important, is we're really working hard, those of us who are in film and TV at Riot, to not hold ourselves apart from the rest of the company. I think if you look at companies that, you know, never got stuff off the ground despite efforts like Activision or Xbox Studios, you know, the big thing they had is what I call the organ rejection problem where they were never viewed as like part of those organizations. They never made the effort, I think, in a big way to sort of make themselves members of that community. There was a lot of distrust between the sort of video game culture and the Hollywood culture. And I definitely think that when they were interviewing me for my job, like one of the things they were testing for is like, can you do Hollywood things without being a Hollywood douchebag, essentially? <laughs> That's a good uh, test. Yeah. <laughs> Solid. You know? Few and, people pass that test. Yeah. So <laughs> that, therein lies a problem, right? 
So, you know, so we really think about like being good members of the community, really getting buy-in, making sure that people who, you know, come from the games have a voice in the process and that we're not just like keeping them at arm's length. And I think that's the most important thing is we're not like, you know, take treating League of Legends and Runeterra as like IP that we licensed from some third party and now we're going to do what we want. We're really like meaningfully taking advantage of being inside of Riot and making sure that, you know, I always say I'm not here to turn Riot into an entertainment company. I'm here to teach Riot to do entertainment things while it continues to be itself. And that's how we succeed. Excellent. Well, thanks a lot, Ken, for joining us. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Appreciate uh, it. I think probably you guys are all excited because Arcane was very good and very successful. So more good things in the future. There will be a season two. I can't tell you yeah. when. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Ken. We don't we don't have a rom com, but you know, let me just throw this out. Zaya Rakan. They've been dating forever until he met Yumi. He's so glad he's not you know, wearing the mic right, right now.